Okay, so you guys all ready to hear the breakdown of the monstrous hand. I, I tell you what, Twitter's, Twitter can be toxic, bro. Some people are nuts. I won this big hand against Bryn Kenny early on um, in level two of the in level two of the super high roller boy. I was like, oh, you only won the super high roller boy because you got that lucky card. Da, 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 Daniel, you know, you wouldn't have won if you didn't win that. It's fucking day one, bro. It's level two. You know, I got my side. I hit a card. What do you want from my life? Jesus. I guess. Yeah. Right. Oh, like here's what people are. And I'll discuss this as we go. Like my stack was never at risk in this hand. I was never going to lose a massive pot. I was going to lose. There's a lot of cards that can come off where I'm going to lose chips, but I was never getting stacked in this spot, okay? And let's talk about the hand, because you guys know. Very, very interesting hand against Bryn Kenny. Oh, why are you doing a video about Bryn Kenny? Oh, Bryn Kenny. Oh, shut up, all right. I don't fucking know why Bryn Kenny. What is he? A th- I don't I'm not. Why am I going on this tangent right now? Whatever. Okay. I don't know. Anyway, Bryn Kenny. You, you feel that tractor beam, that lure well, wanting to be out there as we see Kenny picking up the aces? Well, hold that thought. I mean, BK here with the aces. But uh, just the short answer is no. Of course, I love playing, but uh, I love being in here with you too, pal. I mean, you know, collect the ideas for a few days and just observe the proceedings. It's uh, it's a nice way to spend an afternoon. Batsy Akuski was a, with a pretty one next door. Low jack, high jack here. He's just gone. Note the proceedings. Collect the ideas. Well, Orpin and Chidwick out. On the topic of those ideas, how much variance do you see Negreanu's going to defend here with the pocket threes in terms of ideologies out there? So Bryn Kenny at the 1 in 2,000 level makes a standard raise this deep. He's sitting on like 220,000. He makes it 5K, 2.5X under the gun, okay? I'm in the big line, and I look down at a couple of threes. It's a great spot, fine, you know, looking to flop a set against a pretty strong under the gun range, you know, generally speaking. He understands that, you know, under the gun, he's going to have, you know, strong. He's not going to be playing as many, you know, marginal hands. So he's going to have a strong range. So I love this spot. You know, it's 3,000 more. Certainly priced in with a pair. We're going to call. Check. Top set against a wheel draw here. We'll get to the question momentarily. In the meantime, one would presume we're going to see some added streets as... Kenny flings 5K out there. Looks like Daniel toying with Ray's comes with call. Seemingly prudent. All right, now the flop comes with an ace, four, five, and two spades. Okay, so that flop, uh, it still favors him because he raised under the gun. So the under the gun raising range is going to have a lot of ace something in it. Ace king, ace queen, ace jack, ace ten, blah, 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 right? And all the suited aces and stuff like that. My range in the big line, it's going to be wider. I've already got 2,000 in. So overall, range advantage, Bryn. So we do what we used to do. Check, right? Check the threes. We do have something on this flop, though. So we're going to continue. Bryn goes ahead and bets 5,000. For 5,000, we, of course, call. And now there is 23,000 in this pot. Neither player with a spade, oh, and the man. three of spades is very bad news for Daniel. Perhaps some relief, given that it does present flush and straights on the board, but he comes out swinging, and to be fair, this is not exactly a great card for Kenny. Well said, Ali. Indeed does come out swinging. Kenny with a little look back. Goes for call. And the turn is the three of spades. So it's a really interesting card. Of course, we know we know now that Bryn had three aces. But for me, it looks like I have the best hand, right? He probably doesn't have a deuce, okay, because he raised under the gun. I certainly could because I'm in the big blind. I can have a flush, right? I can have a whole bunch of stuff. So I also feel like, so let's say he has a hand like King Jack with the Jack of Spades or King of Spades. If I check, he's probably going to check back a lot and then just take the free equity and maybe hit a flush and whatnot. So I decide, you know what? I'm going to charge you a little, Bryn, because I got the three threes, and I'm not going to get raised here um, hardly ever, right? Like, what hands are going to raise? Really, the only hands that Bryn is going to raise is flushes. And if he has those hands, and some bluffs, of course. And if he has those flushes, that's fine, because I still have, you know, I still have uh, equity to try to fill up. So I bet 10,023, which is uh, pretty close to half pot. Pretty sizable. Actually, 
Yeah, well, 10 and 23. Anyway, so now the pot is 43,000. Brin obviously calls with the three aces. There's really not a lot else he should be doing here in this spot with three aces. There's no sense turning it into a bluff. Um, you know, just call and slow trap or, or whatever the case may be. Oh, my God. Quad threes. Runner, runner. This is a 990 to one shot. Oh, man. I, Unbelievably I, uh... <laughs> improbable. Oof. And that's going to be it for Sensei Kenny. Yes. Granted, one. quads and a straight flush are available, but we have aces full, Nick. Uh, you know, the, uh, let's see. Uh, indeed, it does appear to be the end for, for Sensei Kenny, but let us just observe. Whoa, yeah. River the three. What the hell just happened? Oh, my God. Top set against the pair, and he had runner, runner quads. How lucky, right? And it's true. But if you think about it, up until this point, I put in 3K pre, 5K on the flop, and 10K on the turn. So I put in about 18K of my stack, a very small percentage of my stack um, when I was behind. And the important street comes now. Now, when that three hits the river, obviously my, my dream is that he has pocket aces, right? The question is, how much should I bet with 43,000 out there? A lot of options. You could use a small blocker bet, you know, something like 15K or 12K or something like that, and hope that he raises you as a bluff right? Some of the time. Or you can hope that he's really, really strong, you know, and you, and you use a larger size, hoping that he'll raise that anyway, because he has like the aces full uh, or pocket fives or something along those lines. Um, so I elect to go ahead and say, okay, well, what would I bet with a flush here, right? So now I'm thinking about what does my whole range do? I think all my flushes bet about 25K-ish, like two-thirds pot in that neighborhood. So go ahead, bet 25K. What a run out this is, Ali, as you said, 990 to 1, some odd. Are there worlds in which, given how deep they are, and granted it's a touch premature, we know the They're raise is inbound that, from Kenny. They're not that deep, though. It's only it's only 110 BVs to start. Listen, you mentioned the straight flush as well. After the ensuing rejam, I don't think Bryn is going to love it. So there are possibly worlds where you, you rise up and just say, is he really doing this with a hand worse than Aces full? But uh, only 97,000 back, though. I think this one is just a wrap for Bryn. He goes ahead and raises me to 105,000, as he should, because he has Aces full, right? So now you look at my four threes and you think, wow, this is the nuts, but it isn't, right? Deuce five of spades is the nuts. Now, as we talked about before, do I think Bryn's under the gun raising range continues, uh, con contains a deuce five of spades? No. So essentially I have the nuts, unless he's playing way outside of what's expected. And this is partly where some players get into traps and they trick themselves is when they go, he can never have this because he wouldn't raise there. So if a player starts doing that, you know, then, you, you know, you could gain a lot of equity in spots like that. So for example, if I knew for sure that Bryn can never have deuce five of spades, then I have the nuts. However, if I don't know that, I actually have a very difficult decision <laughs> with, with quad because I don't have the nuts. I have the second nuts. Oh, you guys are like, how can you not move in or whatever like that? My range can contain deuce five of spades because I'm in the big blind. It makes complete sense for me to have this hand. And I can also have the pocket threes, right? So for him, when he raises me and I move all in, he has to ask the question, what in the world do I beat? My goodness. Start the bus. All in. And you see, Bryn, he has the aces full uh, and isn't snap calling because he recognizes it's the third nuts. I guess I have the third nuts. Oh, there you go, Ollie. Call? This is disgusting. <laughs> Jeez. GG, sir. Appears that he's covered. I mean. Sick. So I got 100. Bryn Kenny by it's 200. Not a huge margin. 235. Covered by yeah. Negranu and 262. Yeah, go so, down. Bro, that's sick. As soon as you said that, I'm like, oh no, I think he has the ace. Still manages to find the sportsmanship as he hands a fist bump over, but still has that panda chain too. Flames on the oh. panda, you know, the diamond panda, but uh. Well, that that panda yeah. was definitely three three uh, there, Ali. My goodness. Torched, along with the rest of Bryn Kenny and his 
gaming tokens. GG. Somebody has to take an insane one right off the bat. Took it well. He, he makes it 105, and I put him in for like another 100-ish, right? So he says it. You can hear him in the video say, oh, I've got, I got the third nuts. I guess I got a call, right? But I guess the real question ultimately is, does he, right? Now, nobody's ever going to fault any human being for calling it off with aces full. Like, it's absolutely sick beat and all that stuff. But I think if we dig deeper and we really think about this hand on a deeper level, you have to ask yourself, okay, so if I'm not bluffing, right, if I'm value betting, I have you beat because I'm not moving in with pocket fives. I'm not moving in with ace three. Those hands, if I have them, I'm going to bet. You raise, I'm like, oh shit, he can have pocket aces, call. I'm not going to risk, I'm not going to, I'm not going to put the third bet in, right? So with aces full, you beat no value. You don't, okay? You only beat bluffs. Now, the question is, what are the bluffs, right? So let's take a look at the board there. So what are the bluffs that I could have? Well, I guess one of the key cards I could have is, let's say, for example, I did have five, six of spades, okay? So with five, six of spades, I go ahead and, you know, bet my flush, looking to get paid off. He raises, and I go, ooh, wait a minute. I have the five of spades. I block pocket fives, whatever. That means very little. But I also block the deuce five of spades. So that hand, maybe five, seven, but pretty much very few bluffs here that I'm ever going to show up with. And they're typically going to contain the five of spades with another card. So probably not five, eight, five, nine off or stuff like that. It would have to be an ace five off, four, five off, five, six off. Like a lot of these hands, I'm just going to fold preflop, right? So really it would be the only hands that you're going to beat are hands where I value bet the flush. Okay. Got raised, realized, uh uh-oh, (laughs) uh-oh, I don't have the best hand here, but I do have range advantage because I have the deuce five of spades in my range and he doesn't. So I could go all in. Right. The question is, would I do that? (laughs) No, (laughs) definitely not. So, so this is why, like when people talk about theory and like what the right play is, right? So when you punch this into a solver, of course, ace is full calls, right? And it should, but against the player like myself in this spot for the three bet jam on the river, who's never bluffing here. It ends up being like, despite the price, it it ends up just being a mistake. So this is partly why, and this discussion sort of come up on Twitter recently about who would have the higher win rates in tournaments. Would it be, you know, a perfect GTO bot who's ICM conscience and plays every spot, you know, balanced and optimal? Would they be the biggest winners or would human beings who can make adjustments be the biggest winner? For example, you know, you know, never bluff Bob, uncle never bluff Bob. I tweeted this. He, uh, he just jams the river for four X pot and GTO says, well, I need to have a calling frequency here when, you know, uncle never bluff Bob is actually bluffing 0% of the time. So every time GTO slot machine calls, it's just paying him off where a human would know. Nope. That's uncle never bluff Bob. I don't call him. So from that perspective, the human would gain equity where the bot would, you know, not be able to do so. However, obviously the GTO bot is going to make no mistakes in all the other spots, which makes up for it to a certain degree. So the real, the question is, would a human, um, you know, op- compensate enough with the deviations that they make uh, against the GTO bot, and I, I do believe so. I said this. I said that. Uh, well, I don't want to tell you this stuff because my wife would really kill me. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I, I still think that. Uh, and there are tournaments where that wouldn't be true. I think like if you're talking about super high roller bowl stuff, the biggest winner in the field would be the GTO bot, no question. You take the you know three hundred dollar Orleans you know daily. I'd rather take me than the GTO bot in these five-way limb pots with freaking Uncle Bob and, you know, Aunt Betty. <laughs> you, just, I, you, know, you know what I'm saying. You get it. So anyway, interesting spot here. I mean, um, I bet you Bryn, because, you know, he's a smart guy. He's going to look, he probably looked at the hand and thought, like, maybe I had a fold here. Because he's that, you know, when you play at an elite level, you can make crazy laydowns like this. So sometimes what happens is people get caught up in how strong their hand is. Like, how can I fold this? I've done it a million times where I'm like, how can I fold kings full here, right? Because the guy's only got aces full and you know it, you know, so just do it. But it's very, very difficult to do. Um, But yeah, you know, listen, so that hand obviously put us in good shape, right? Because uh, we had our aces cracked before that. We were, you know, bobbing and weaving we were under our 300k starting stack and this put us in the chip lead which we maintained and we held on to and we did so with a very specific floyd mayweather 
type defense. Oh, rope, dope, rope. Oh, you think you got a free one? Oh, oh, you left your jaw open. Some knockouts here and there. So, uh, yeah, so it worked out really good. But obviously having this hand come up early on allowed me the luxuries of really employing my strategy freely because I didn't have to worry about being short stacked at any point. How, you know, this is a deep stack tournament throughout anyways, but having, you know, like double average early on uh, really allowed me the cushion to play the best tournament that I've ever played in my life. Like in terms of like a dominant performance, I don't know that I've ever gone like wire to wire basically from second level all the way to the end against the top players in the world. So probably my most dominating performance. I was very proud of it. That's why we got the Super Bowl ring up there. Super High Roller Bowl ring, number seven. Guys, if you want to watch the entirety of the Super High Roller Bowl and a whole bunch more high-level play, you got to get yourself a Poker Go subscription. Most of the stuff you can only find on Poker Go. And I'm going to tell you what, as a study tool, nothing better. <laughs>